Welcome back everybody. Today we're going to talk about the chemical basis of behavior. So we're going to focus a little bit more on neurotransmitters, which we pretty much skipped completely last time, um, and also get into some neuropharmacology. So talk about the medications that affect the brain and how they work, and touch a little bit on what um, disorders they're used to treat as well, though that'll be covered a lot more in the later chapters. So, as I mentioned, this week we're focusing on neurotransmitters and psychoactive substances, as well as meditations. This is one of the most fascinating parts of biological psychology, in my opinion. Today, we're going to specifically be focusing on the neurotransmitters that are used in the brain. And then, in subsequent videos, we'll focus more on the psychoactive substances and drugs. So no, neurochemistry is actually a branch of neuroscience that's concerned with the fundamental chemical composition and processes of the nervous system. So at any time um, you're studying the interaction of chemicals, whether endogenous or exogenous, and remember endogenous are chemicals that are come from within the body, and exogenous are chemicals that come from you know, outside the body. Um, so you're studying the interaction of these chemicals and the nervous system. So anytime you're doing that, it falls under neurochemistry. Uh, neuropharmacology is actually a subset of neurochemistry, and it's sometimes called psychopharmacology. We actually have a, um, a graduate level class in psychopharmacology if you're interested. It's, it's a class I absolutely loved. It's very interesting, and it helps give you a much better understanding of how the chemicals in the brain work, but more on that later. Um, so psychopharmacology is the scientific field concerned with the discovery and study of compounds that selectively affect the functioning of the nervous system. So as I mentioned before, today's topic is primarily neurotransmitters, which brings us to the question of what is a neurotransmitter? So here are the basic criteria. The criterion can really be summed up in three basic points. A neurotransmitter must be its endogenous, sorry, I almost said exogenous. Um, it must be endogenous, meaning it must be something that's naturally occurring within the brain. A neurotransmitter must be held in common by the pre- and postsynaptic cell. So it must be released by the presynaptic cell and also have a receptor on the postsynaptic cell in order to be a neurotransmitter. A neurotransmitter must also um, be necessary for intercellular communication. So by that we mean that um, they must be the mechanism that sends the signal. And if they get blocked, then no signal should be received. Um, there are actually some other mechanisms by which neurons can communicate. We won't get into those as much because they're more exceptions rather than the rule, and I want you to know the primary ways that all this work. Um, but with that, to be a neurotransmitter, it has to be the method of communication between the neurons. There are four types of neurotransmitters. They're the amines, amino acids, peptides, and gases. Amine neurotransmitters are based on modifications of a single amino acid nucleus. Um, some of the best known amines are acetylcholine, dopamine, and serotonin. Um, amino acid neurotransmitters are neurotransmitters that themselves are also amino acids. Uh, the best, exam best known examples of these are GABA. Um, which is a key inhibitory neurotransmitter, and glutamate, which is an important excitatory neurotransmitter. We'll be talking about both of these a lot in the f future videos. Uh, peptide neurotransmitters consist of short chains of amino acids. So substance P, which is a key neurotransmitter for inflammation and pain, is a peptide. And there are also um, many of the body's naturally occurring opioids are peptides. And lastly, gas neurotransmitters are actually soluble gas, such as nitric oxide or carbon monoxide, that are produced and released by the neuron um, to alter the functioning of another neuron. So those are the um, classes you need to know. And this is going to, much like there's a table in the last chapter that you need to know, this will be a, cha or a table you really want to memorize. You'll want to know, you know, acetylcholine is an amine. You'll want to know that you know, 
for instance, Java is amino acid, just you'll want to know this table. So spend some time with that because that will be important in your preparation for the quiz. So we talked about this um, a little bit in previous lectures, but just for review, there are ionotropic and metabotropic receptors. Um, Ionotropic receptors are fast. So as soon as something binds to an ionotropic receptor, the ion channel opens very simple, very quick. Metabotropic receptors are a bit slower. When they're activated, they alter the chemical reactions within a cell, such as G proteins, um, in order to open an ion channel. So it's kind of a game of telephone in order to get the ion channel to open. Um, Receptor subtypes are actually a new topic for this lecture. The main point to know here is that the same neurotransmitter can have different effects depending on the subtype of the receptor it binds with. Um, the neurotransmitter binds with all of its subtypes. So with that, for instance, there are different subtypes of um, dopamine receptors. So dopamine will bind to all of them, but depending on which receptor it binds to, it can actually have a different effect. So the receptor type is important, and we'll see this when we talk about schizophrenia. Um, so this helps explain why, for instance, with acetylcholine, you may remember I said that at times it can be excitatory and at other times inhibitory. This is why. It all depends on the subtype of the receptor that the neurotransmitter binds with. So here you just have a brief um, image of ionotropic versus metabotropic receptors. So again with ionotropic, you have your neurotransmitter bind and it will open the channel, so it's a very simple system. With metabotropic, you have it bind, which affects a G protein system, releases a G protein, and that leads to a change within the cell that leads to the ion channels opening. So this is a slightly slower but still very fast process, and you'll see a lot of the neurotransmitters we talked about actually use this process. So um, a little bit more review from the last um, chapter. A ligand is just a substance that binds to a receptor, and a ligand will have one of these three effects. It could be an agonist, which means that it initiates normal effects on the receptor. It does what the neurotransmitter would do. So this all gets very confusing, so I want to spend a little time on it. So an agonist will increase the effect of a neurotransmitter. If I add it to what's naturally occurring in the brain, like if it's a medication, an agonist would be one that led to a greater impact of that neurotransmitter. There are also antagonists. These block the receptor from being activated by other ligands. Um, and we'll talk about these a lot more because A, a lot of medications fall into this, um, this area. I guess the same is true for agonists. We'll talk about both of those. But it can get confusing, as we'll talk about, because something can be a partial agonist and can act as an antagonist. We'll get to that later. Um, but just at this point, I guess, know that an agonist has the same effects or increases the effects of a neurotransmitter. And you can do that either with... Um, endogenously, so if you increase the amount of that neurotransmitter, that would be an agonist effect. Or you can do it exogenously if you have a medication, for instance, that binds to that same receptor and has the same effect, that would also be an agonist. An antagonist blocks the receptor from being activated by other ligands, so it reduces the effect of the neurotransmitter because it doesn't have as many receptors to link up with. And then you can also have an inverse agonist, which um, initiates an effect that is the opposite of the normal function. So instead of maybe being excitatory, it becomes inhibitory. Also, um, review, we talked about endogenous occurring naturally within the body, exogenous occurring from, or coming from outside the body. And there's also co-localization or co-release. This occurs when a nerve cell contains more than one type of neurotransmitter. So you, you can have 
neurons that are just dopamine or they're just a single neurotransmitter or you can have it where they're they have several neurotransmitters. So this would be one where you have a neur you have a neuron or a nerve cell that contains more than one type of neurotransmitter. So now getting on a little bit to the different systems of neurotransmitters that we have in the brain. Uh, first, acetylcholine. Um, acetylcholine, as we mentioned previously, was um, the first neurotransmitter discovered, actually. Um, its location in the brain was mapped by studying the location of an enzyme that's important for its synthesis. So here on this brain here that you see over here, you can see where acetylcholine is based and where it projects to within the brain. Um, so the basal forebrain is important because it contains a large group of acetylcholine cells, plus it pr projects to the amygdala, hippocampus, and other parts of the cortex. Um, the connection with the hippocampus is important as widespread loss of cholinergic neurons, cholinergic again being acetylcholine neurons, um, is linked with Alzheimer's disease. So it's clinically a very important link. Um, it also plays a role in how we treat Alzheimer's. There are several medications that are approved to treat Alzheimer's, but the best known one is Aricept, which is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So acetylcholinesterase is, oop, I got very dark on the webcam. Eh, eh, that's a little better. Acetylcholinesterase, oh, oh well, I'll be dark. Acetylcholinesterase is an enzyme that um, deactivates acetylcholine. So with that, when you have an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, what that does is it inhibits this enzyme, meaning that it can't, in, it can't deactivate acetylcholine as well. This leads to more acetylcholine being in the system um, and increases its effects. So that's how this medication works. It would be an ac acetylcholine agonist because it increases the effect of the acetylcholine in the system. Um, so also, as we mentioned earlier, the effect of a neurotransmitter depends on the receptor. For acetylcholine, we have two primary um, receptors. The nicotinic are primarily ionotropic receptors, so they're fast with opening ion channels, and they're also excitatory. They appear to be more associated with movement, which is why antagonists such as terrari uh, lead to paralysis. As you may have guessed, um, the exogenous drug nicotine is an agonist of the acetylcholine nicotinic receptors. So that's, that's how nicotine works. It actually activates these receptors. Um, the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors are primarily metabotropic, um, so they're a little slower, as we talked about. And these can be either excitatory or inhibitory. They appear to be important for cognition, as drugs that block these receptors lead to significant changes in cognition, including drowsiness, confusion, and blurred vision. Most of the uh, um, amine neurotransmitters are what we call monoamines, and there are two types of these, the catecholamines and the um, idolamines. You'll want to know the difference between these two and know which is in which group. So, um, the difference between these two is how they are developed. The catecholamines are derived from the amino acid um, tyrosine, whereas the ind um, indolamines are derived from tryptophan. You'll, you'll probably know tryptophan. Tryptophan is the, um, the chemical that's in turkey that makes you feel tired after eating a turkey dinner. That's tryptophan. So that's actually the base for those um, indolamines, whereas the catecholamines, their base um, is the tyrosine. So one of the things, this is actually one of those, every now and again you get to where you look at the stuff, you get to know it a little bit, and you just wonder. And one of the things that I just wondered when I learned about this is... Um, Look at the indolamines. Serotonin is one of the indolamines. So if tryptophan is the chemical that is the precursor to serotonin, why wouldn't I be able to just give people heavy tryptophan 
foods like turkey and have that treat their depression. Well, believe it or not, this has actually been studied, uh, and it, it unfortunately doesn't work. Um, so, So and Walter in 2011 did a study, and they found that, um, unfortunately, modifying the diet does not um, have a significant effect on serotonin levels. So if you're trying to treat depression, don't give someone turkey. It doesn't work. But, however, you can kind of see um, how neuroscientists think about these things. You know, this is how you come up with new treatments for medications is you look at what they do, you look at the precursors, and you say, I wonder if this works. Because when you, let's talk about Parkinson's. Um, with Parkinson's, you have a decrease in dopamine, and with that, we can't just give someone more dopamine. It actually can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So what do we do if we can't give someone dopamine? We actually give them a medication called L-DOPA. L-DOPA is the precursor of dopamine. So we give them basically as much of the precursor as we can, as much of the building blocks as we can, so that they have plenty, um, they have plenty for when, you know, so that's not the limiting factor, that's not the bottleneck. And in doing so, you can actually increase um, dopamine. So it works in some cases, just doesn't work with tryptophan. So actually, perfect timing. Uh, shifting to dopamine, dopamine originates in the midbrain, especially the substan substantia nigra and those surrounding areas. So substantia nigra, you'll want to know, is dopamine. Um, there are two pathways to note of dopamine. First is the uh, um, meso uh, triatal, sorry, I'm not always great with pronunciations, meso triatal pathway. Um, which originates around the midbrain um, and then it ascends to affect the triatum which is made up of the caudate nucleus and the putamen. Um, these structures are part of the basal ganglia which we discussed in chapter 2 and with that you'll probably remember basal ganglia is really important for movement. So with that um, this pathway is very important for motor control and also neuronal loss in, in the substantia nigra especially, but also of dopamine um, neurons, is related to Parkinson's disease. So the dopamine pathway, um, or the mesolimbocortical pathway, also originates in the midbrain, and it goes up into the VTA, the ventral tegmental area and then projects to the limbic system and the cortex. So this system's a little different. Instead of being movement, this system actually seems to be really important for the reward, reinforcement, and learning aspects of dopamine. And abnormalities with this um, projection are associated with schizophrenia. So as we'll discuss in later chapters, there are the D2 receptors of dopamine that appear to be especially associated with schizophrenia and the primary target of new antipsychotic medications. Norepinephrine is also um, known as noradrenaline, and it comes primarily from two structures in or near the brainstem, the locus coriolis, which is part of the pons, and the lateral tegmental system, which is in the midbrain. All of the norepinephrine receptors are metabotropic, so they're that slower type with the G proteins that we talked about. Norepinephrine, as you can tell from the picture, projects very widely and affects many parts of the brain. And we think it's very important for many behavioral and psychological processes, including mood, overall arousal, and also sexual behavior. Serotonin is probably the one you most no, it's um, unquestionably one of the most important neurotransmitters in the brain, as well as for clinical psychology for that matter. The serotonin neurons are primarily located in the Ruffe nuclei, and um, there are, they're relatively few in number. There are actually only about 200,000 serotonin, uh, serotonergic um, nu or neurons, sorry about that. So there aren't that many of them, but they have a great deal of control over the rest of the brain, as you can see.
Um, all but one type of serotonin receptors are metabotropic, so they're usually metabotropic. And they're important for many different things, as you know. Primarily, they're implicated in sleep, mood, sexual behavior, and anxiety. Which kind of makes sense, because think of the um, some of the side effects you see with antidepressants. You have some effects on sleep, mood, hopefully. Uh, sexual behavior, you certainly have some effects there. And anxiety. So we'll talk about that more as we get into the medications. Then, as we mentioned at the start of lecture, um, amino acids can also be neurotransmitters. The two best known amino acid neurotransmitters are glutamate and GABA. Uh, there are others, but for the quiz, you just need to know these two. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter, whereas GABA is inhibitory. Glutamate is associated with, um, also it's associated with this problem called excitotoxicity which is a phenomenon when, which is where there's a brain injury, such as a stroke or a trauma. When this happens, it provokes an excessive release of glutamate, and this results in prolonged depolarization, which kills the affected neurons. So that's not good. So it's one of the, one of the reasons why when you have brain injury, bad things happen, because you did this, the cells tend to, the neurons fire to death, basically, because you have so much um, excitivity. Is that a word? Oh, well, I just made it a word. Um, GABA has three primary receptors. There's GABA A, GABA B, GABA C. GABA A are ionotropic, and they're, they create the fastest inhibition, whereas GABA B is metabotropic and thus associated with more of a slow-occurring inhibitory potential. Lastly, GABA C are ionotropic, um, and they use the chloride channel. Since GABA is inhibitory, GABA agonists, so again, things that increase the effect of um, GABA, are often used as tranquilizers, such as Valium, um, and they also can use um, GABA antagonists, on the other hand, um, can actually result in seizures. So if you inhibit GABA, too much, you can have seizures because you don't have that inhibitory keeping it in check force in play. Lastly, peptides and gases can also be neurotransmitters. We'll talk about this more in future chapters, especially the opioid peptides, but for now all you need to know is that peptides and gases can also serve as neurotransmitters.